Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Commissary, and we welcome those of you that are watching on Facebook. And we are going to be in Revelation chapter 7, Revelation 7, right at the end of the chapter, and we'll go into chapter 8 also. I want to mention those uh, that are on the sick list, at least some of them. Um, Bob uh, Pillow, as we announced Sunday, uh, had a heart attack last week, and uh, he has five blockages uh, that uh, uh, cannot be remedied with stents, and so he'll have uh, open heart surgery either Friday or Monday. Let us know. Uh, also, Lee Poor's uh, sister, Mary Lou Moore, uh, is doing better after having uh, an aneurysm fixed. Eddie Taylor is home after knee uh, replacement surgery, and uh, he said he, he was really miserable Monday, but he's feeling a lot better now, and he has one of those machines uh, at his house that he has to use three times a day, and also uh, he is uh, going uh, for uh, physical therapy uh, several times a week, so keep Eddie in your prayers. Olivia Wesley is doing much better, and uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, and Daphne Smith uh, is, is uh, doing better. Norma Reeves is home. Um, Daniel Lindsay is in St. Bernard's. Uh, and so keep all of these uh, in, in your uh, uh, prayers. Uh, there'll be more announcements made uh, in uh, a few minutes after our class is over. Let's go ahead and uh, bow and pray. Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to be here tonight to study your word. But we're thankful for those that are with us on Facebook, and we pray that we'll be able to take something uh, from the book of Revelation and make it applicable to our lives. We're thankful for all the wonderful ways that you continue to bless us every single day. Thankful for physical blessings and especially those spiritual blessings available through your son. We're thankful for him, for his willingness to come to this world, live a perfect life, and then to die on a cross. Uh, we're thankful for your Holy Spirit that dwells in your children, grateful for the Bible. We're thankful for the church, and we're grateful for the, for the congregation uh, that meets here, and we pray that your blessings would uh, be upon us tonight. We pray also, Father, for all these that we've mentioned and all those that are on our prayer list. We pray that uh, you'll be with the uh, them that you'll be with their families with their caregivers and we pray that you'll give them exactly what they need at this time please be with us as we continue to study help us always be willing to uh, follow uh, what you have instructed us to do in your word the bible we pray in jesus name amen i've got a lot of books in my uh, personal library. I think I've got 27 to 30 commentaries on the book of Revelation. Uh, got too many books really. Uh, but I, I thought it was interesting to see the uh, titles of some of the uh, Revelation commentaries. Most of the commentaries simply say commentary on the book of Revelation. Uh, but years ago Richard Rogers uh, who taught uh, at the Sunset School of Biblical Studies, uh, wrote a book on Revelation. It was called Hallelujah Anyway. A lot of bad things uh, were going to happen to the early church. A lot of uh, trials, tribulations. Uh, and uh, I really like the title of his book, Hallelujah Anyway, because we know who's going to be on the winning side when all is said and done. Uh, Ray Summers, who's not in our fellowship, but uh, who's written an excellent book on uh, Revelation. Uh, he's not a premillennialist, and we'll talk more about premillennialism later, but uh, his uh, uh, commentary is worthy is the lamb. And uh, worthy is the lamb. Remember that uh, no one uh, was found that could open up the seals uh, except uh, the Lamb of God, Christ. Uh, and we've already looked at that in Revelation. Joe Jones, uh, 
uh, and we know Joe, he has connection to us. Uh, his commentary is victory in Jesus. And, and, and that's, that's the idea, is that uh, in spite of the bad things that, that happen to good people, in the end, there's a victory uh, in, in Jesus. William Hendrickson, a long time ago, wrote a book called More Than Conquerors on Revelation. Now, More Than Conquerors is a statement out of Romans, the eighth chapter, in verse uh, 37. And uh, uh, I never thought that I uh, could see a similarity between the book of Romans and the book of Revelation. Uh, but uh, uh, the theme of Romans 8, at least the last few uh, verses there, is that uh, regardless, regardless, nothing is going to separate us from the love of Jesus. And then we get over to Revelation and all these things, uh, you know, are happening uh, to the early churches and they are warned that some more bad things were going to happen. And uh, William Hendrickson uh, took the phrase out of Romans 8 and said, yeah, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, and I like that. Uh, Rubel Shelley uh, wrote uh, a book on Revelation called The Lamb and His Enemies, and then a book that I don't have, uh, written by Dennis Johnson, Triumph of the Lamb. And I think all these uh, express uh, what is going on in Revelation. It is a book of hope. It is a book of encouragement. And uh, we look at it sometimes as a, a, a book uh, with, with a very dark side to it. And uh, it kind of scares us a little bit. But it was uh, written uh, to give uh, those early Christians uh, some hope. And uh, very, uh, I like the titles of those books. Uh, and uh, we know, we've been, we've been looking at this, that uh, Revelation was written by John to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, that would be uh, the present country of Turkey. Those churches were located there. Uh, and uh, they were Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And uh, as John opened the book, he said, uh, I, I want to uh, show you the things that must soon take place. You know, so many uh, commentators say, well, he's talking about... Uh, you know, the French Revolution in the 1700s. There he's talking about uh, Napoleon over here. He's talking about Hitler and all that. And basically, he's writing them uh, a book on, on the contemporary issues, what was facing them right away. Um, and uh, we, we read about those special letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three. And uh, you remember the format, he would tell them the uh, good things he, he saw in the congregations, and then he would uh, mention some negative things about them and tell them what they needed to do. They needed to repent. Uh, two churches, he didn't uh, say anything negative about them, Smyrna and Philadelphia. One church, he didn't say anything positive about uh, that congregation, the church at Laodicea. So that's chapters two and three, and we get chapter four, and we have a scene in heaven. And the scene is that God is on his throne. You know, some of these churches had already established, uh, or had already faced, rather, persecution. Others were going to. Uh, and, uh, you know, that could be very discouraging, but then you get this scene in heaven, and God is on his throne. He's still in control. And regardless what happens in our lives, in our time, God is still in control. It's a lesson that we need to uh, remember. Then we get to chapter five, and here you have a scroll uh, sealed with seven seals. Uh, and uh, no one is found worthy to, to open these seals to reveal uh, what uh, the seven churches needed to know. And uh, then finally, uh, the one that was uh, found to be worthy was the Lion of Judah, Jesus. And he took the scroll and uh, he then began to break the seals uh, to reveal uh, what, uh, what was ahead. And in chapter six, we have six of those seals uh, revealed. Uh, in the first seal, you have a rider on a white horse. Uh, I believe that this is representative of Christ going forth to conquer. Uh, 
and uh, there are going to be some there are going to be some bad things happen. But remember, Christ is 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 going to be the victorious one in the end. And the second uh, seal is uh, revealed. Uh, there's a man on a red horse, uh, probably representative of uh, of bloodshed. War was going to be in their future. Uh, the third one is uh, uh, is open, and a man on a black horse, probably representing famine. That often accompanies war. Uh, and then uh, the uh, uh, fourth horse, uh, you have a man on a pale horse, representing death. And of course, that accompanies war too. It's all kind of a bleak uh, picture there. Uh, and then uh, the fifth seal is is broken. And you have pictured there martyrs, people who had died for the cause of Christ under the altar, and they are crying out, how long, how long, how long? And, and that question is still being asked today. You look at the direction that the world uh, is heading, and, and, and sometimes you just want to throw up your hand and say, how long is the Lord going to let this go on? Uh, when's he going to take vengeance upon on evildoers? Uh, you know, uh, well, when's the world going to come to an end? We're still asking that question. And then you have uh, the sixth seal uh, broken, and I believe that, uh, and, and there's a lot of disagreement on this, it's, it's, it's a picture of judgment. Judgment doesn't always refer to the final judgment when we'll stand before Jesus. Uh, judgment often uh, stands uh, for a, a condemnation that is placed upon people. I think that uh, what is shown when the sixth seal is broken is that Rome is going to face judgment. They're going to face uh, defeat. They are not going to win, uh, ultimately. No world power is going to win. Uh, Satan is going to be defeated, and, and his angels, that, and angels come in many forms, are going to be defeated. Now, if you look at the last, uh, uh, last verse in chapter 6, uh, uh, Let's see here. Um, verse 17. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Who's going who's gonna to stand? Well, that question is answered in chapter 7. And we've been looking at chapter 7. And uh, the, these will be uh, those that ha have been sealed uh, with the... With, uh, uh, and these are the bond servants of God. If you look at verse three in chapter in chapter seven, look at look at verse three really quickly here. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our Lord on their foreheads. Figurative figurative term. We have to understand that. Well, of of whom does he speak when he, when he speaks about uh, about these? Who are the bond servants? Well, go back to chapter 1, verse 1. We've, we've looked at this uh, uh, previously. But in chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Obviously, the bond servants are Christians. These are the ones that are going to be protected. And they are represented here in uh, Revelation chapter 7 by the 144,000 in verses 4 through 8. Uh, symbolic numbers, but I think that when you, when you look at that, there's, there's no doubt that he's talking about, uh, about Christians. Now, they represent God's people. Uh, they represent the church. They will be the ones that will uh, be able to stand. Uh, they will be protected, maybe not from uh, tribulation, maybe not from persecution, but through tribulation and through uh, persecution. And we made the point that God did not remove the Red Sea, he parted it. And uh, we have Red Seas in, in, in our way sometimes, God doesn't remove them, but he, he, he parts them. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then you go to... Uh, Chapter, um, uh, well, let's see. You look at verse 9 then. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could, could count. Now, who, who are these? The 144,000 are God's children that are still on earth. 
Uh, they're the ones that, that are still alive. They're the ones facing persecution and, and hard times. The multitude that is, that is mentioned here, beginning at verse 9, are God's children who are no longer on the earth. They're in heaven. They're clothed in white robes. These are the ones that have come through the tribulation. These are the ones that have survived the hard times. These are the ones that uh, have been faithful to God and they're now in heaven. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, you have a difference here. You have uh, God's church here on the earth represented by 144,000. And then you have up here uh, in, in, in the, later in the chapter, the multitudes. Where are they? Not on earth. They are in heaven, the surrounding the, the throne. Uh, and we, we talked about that uh, a, li a little bit here. Um, uh, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk more about premillennialism, the belief that Jesus is going to return uh, and, and then he, he's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years uh, when we get over, in, in especially in chapters uh, 14 and uh, 20. And uh, we looked briefly as, as we were closing two weeks ago because we didn't meet last Wednesday night, you remember. Uh, we uh, looked at questions 12 and 13 in chapter 7. Uh, if you look at those questions really, really quickly, uh, the, ones, uh, the ones that are in heaven, uh, what, what are they going to do day and night? And, and, and look at verse 15. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. Now, they're not on earth. They're, they're, they're in heaven. And they serve him day and night in his temple. Uh, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Uh, and if you worry about what you're going to do when, when, you, when, you get to, uh, when you get to heaven, notice I didn't say if you get to heaven, when you get to heaven. Uh, uh, you, you, you're not just going to sit around and do nothing. Uh, and I met a woman one time who said she didn't want to go to heaven because she couldn't think of anything more boring than just sitting around praising God all, th all the time. Well, I happen to like to praise God. I'm sure you do too, and that's why you're here. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're going to serve Him. How? I don't know. Uh, I, I think it'll be exciting, whatever, whatever job He has us to do. Uh, and, and so we, that's something to look forward to on, 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 on the great uh, uh, ministries or whatever he has in store uh, for us there. And then you have question uh, 13 uh, on, on uh, chapter, chapter 7. It says, name several things that will never happen again to those who are before the throne. This is the multitudes that, that have come through the tribulation. And uh, if you look at verses 16 and 17, they will hunger no more, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb is in the center of the throne, will be their shepherd, and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And, and real briefly here, turn over to chapter 21. Chapter 21 is a great chapter on heaven, and if you look at verse 4 in chapter 21, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. And so these are some of the things that will no longer exist. So we are now going to look at, 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 chapter, at chapter 8. Any comment that, that you want to make here? Any, any brief comment that you want to make? Okay, looking at chapter 8 then, uh, no, question number one, what happened when the seventh seal was broken? There was silence. Okay, if you look at verse one, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Uh, we're not told why there was silence. A couple ideas are given by uh, commentators. One would say maybe it was for delayed judgment. Um, look over at 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Go back two pages, 2 Peter 3, and look at verse 9. Chapter 3, uh, he talks about the end of the world. Uh, 
you know, uh, verses 10 through 13. But look at verse 9, verse before that. Uh, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, maybe this is a partial answer to the question at the end of chapter 6. How long, how long? Why hasn't he come back? Why hasn't he dealt with this? Well, God, uh, he's, he's patient. And uh, he, he, he hopes, he wants everyone to be saved, that verse says. And so it could be delayed judgment. Others have thought that well, there was silence there for a dramatic effect. But, uh, you know, main thing we need to remember is that there was silence there for about half, half an hour. Uh, how many angels stood before God? Question two. Seven. See the number seven uh, quite, quite often, don't we? And what was given to them? Trumpets. Seven trumpets. And again, this is symbolic language. Uh, have to understand that. Uh, now, before there were seven seals. And, and uh, when you break a seal, it reveals something. And he's uh, uh, broken six of those seals, and he's, he's revealed various things. And now the seventh seal is, is broken, and there's, there's seven trumpets. Uh, a seal, a broken seal, reveals. Uh, trumpets announce, or they, they warn. And uh, a trumpet. Uh, look at look if you will at uh, at First Corinthians 15. Go to First Corinthians 15 for for just a, a minute. Very familiar passage. Uh, and he's talking about uh, the the resurrection, talking about uh, the judgment and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, beginning at verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling, twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Trumpets warn, or they announce. And the idea here is that the trumpet will sound, and it will announce then, of the resurrection and 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 the Lord's uh, the Lord's return. Uh, okay. Any comment you want to make before we go further? Question number four. Uh, you have the seven angels, and where was the other angel standing? Did you look at that? At the altar. He's standing at the altar. Uh, if you look at verse 3, another angel came, not one of the seven apparently, and stood at the altar. Um, and uh, what was he holding? Holding a, go a golden censer. Now, this takes us back uh, to uh, the tabernacle scene. Uh, and, and the furniture of the tabernacle had a functional purpose. It had a spiritual purpose and also had a functional uh, purpose. Uh, the lampstand, probably representative of, of God's Holy Spirit, but it actually did give light, okay? Uh, the table of showbread was in a holy place in the, in the tabernacle. Uh, and uh, it was a, a place uh, where they put their dishes and their and their pans and their jars and their bowls and and the showbread, uh, which the the priest uh, uh, prepared and and ate, and uh, that could be representative because in the book of Hebrews that we just finished studying, uh, you know whoever wrote Hebrews uh, talks about that in chapter nine, but the, but the showbread uh, would be representative of, of spiritual food. Uh, and, and, and uh, we, we have spiritual food today, not physical food. 
Then you had the altar of incense. Um, and uh, uh, it was right before the curtain and apparently moved inside the holy, holy uh, place, uh, most holy place on the Day of Atonement, it seems like. But anyway, there'd be a pleasant uh, scent uh, arising from the incense. Uh, and that was representative of, of prayers that were going up to, to God. Uh, and uh, you, you have here an angel holding a golden censer and it it, uh, it contained uh, the incense that was going to be going to be burned, uh, and then look at uh, uh, let's see here. Look at question five. Uh, what was given to the other angel? Oh, he he was given the golden censer. We've already answered that, haven't we? Okay, and, and, and there was much incense in the golden, in the golden cens censer. And the idea here, according to some writers, is that it, it, uh, it was added to the prayers. The, the incense going up to God, representing, representing the prayers of, of the saints. Uh, well, what, what did these other, uh, this other incense represent? It probably represented uh, more prayers. Uh, maybe Jesus is our intercessor. We we have someone that is a go-between for us whenever we're, whenever we pray and when we tr endeavor to live the Christian life. Uh, Hebrews seven twenty five says he he ever lives to make intercession for us. Uh, the Holy Spirit is is an intercessor for us. If you go back to Romans 8 and, and, and in our prayers, the Holy Spirit is an intercessor. We can be intercessors for each other. James 5, 16 says we ought to pray for each other. Well, you, you put, you put uh, what Jesus does for us, you put the, what the Holy Spirit does for us, you put what fellow Christians do for us, and these prayers go up to God. Uh, and uh, and God, uh, God answers those prayers. He doesn't always answer those prayers exactly the way that, that, we, that we want uh, them to be answered. But I want you to look at, at, at uh, question number uh, six. What did the other angel do with the censor? What did he do? Filled it with fire. Huh? Filled it with fire. Okay, he filled it with fire and then what did he do? He threw it to the earth. He threw it to the earth. This may uh, show the power of prayer, the incense going up to God, you know, and and then the the angel he takes his censer, he throws it down to the earth, you know, and uh, and so uh, uh, prayer works, you know. The enemy is going to be defeated. The enemy is is Rome in in this case, uh, and and Christ is going to deal with the oppressor. And you can count on that because of the prayers that have been offered up. Now, when we come back next week, we'll be looking, uh, looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the the different uh, the different trumpets that are that are given here in, in chapter chapter eight. But we'll start there next week then. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service. I said afternoon, uh, and it is still afternoon, but in a two or three months it will be evening again. In December it will be already dark for a while by now. So uh, we're certainly glad that you're here, and uh, we invite you to join us anytime you have an opportunity. Have a nursery uh, just out the double doors and to the left if you need that. It'd be a good time now to silence your electronic devices if you haven't already done so. Next time we'll be meeting together, this congregation will be Sunday morning at 9.30 for our classes. Of course, we meet Sunday evening at 5.30 and, and Wednesday night we meet at 7. 
I have uh, some announcements and some changes since uh, uh, we met Sunday. I'll first uh, try to go over the, the sick uh, that I have. Uh, Norma Reeves, we announced uh, Sunday, uh, got to come home. Uh, she had to go uh, to the back to the ER last night, but she's home again now. So please remember uh, Norma. Uh, Daniel Lindsay uh, is in St. Bernard's. Uh, please keep him and, and his family uh, in your prayers. Bob Pilla uh, is going to have uh, open heart surgery uh, probably Friday or Monday. He's got five blockages that they could not uh, deal with uh, with stents. So please remember Bob and, and his family. Eddie Taylor had his knee replacement surgery. He's home uh, and now doing better. I think he was he was pretty tough uh, for uh, a day or, or two there, the first or second day, but uh, he, he's doing okay and he said he didn't, didn't need anything. He's well taken care of. Um, a good report on uh, Olivia Wesley. Uh, we still need to continue to remember her in our prayers, but the last report is she's doing much better. Um, that may be all that's on my sick list. Are there others that I forgot to mention that I should? Um, remember uh, our evangelism outreach team plans on meeting Sunday uh, afternoon 4.30 uh, here at the building and uh, of course uh, we'll meet for a little while and then we'll have our services, uh, regular services at 5.30 so uh, please remember that. Um, I've announced this before but uh, announce it again Whitney and Lathan Martin uh, we're going to have a baby shower for them September the 10th, 2 p.m., and it's a boy. Uh, also, uh, please continue to remember Mackenzie Moore. Uh, uh, she, she has some, some, some more issues. I think part of them are heart-related, so please, please continue to remember Mackenzie. If there's nothing else in our services uh, tonight, Wes is going to be uh, leading our singing. Uh, Dan Stokes is going to extend the invitation in just a few minutes. Thomas Lindsay will lead us in our closing prayer when we end our service. Now, Laryl Austin will lead us in our opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for making it possible for us to be able to be here tonight. Father, we like taking opportunities, taking advantage of the opportunities we have to meet for Bible study. We know we can do that on our own, but sometimes it helps to talk about it, to hear what others say, to help us think about that as we're trying to decide what is the Scripture saying. Help us all, Father, to be open-minded during those times. We call it Bible study. We all need to know that we need to study no, longer, no, no matter how long we've been a Christian. We don't know it all. There's an awful lot we still need to learn. As we study the book of Revelation, it kind of makes that imprint on our mind. We need to learn more. We need to understand more. We may not be able to understand everything that's there. But Father, I think you'll take care of that. We need to put in the effort, help us as we do, to understand and to use what we read and what we study. Father, tonight we want to thank you for caring about and caring for those who are sick we're having difficult times. We know that you're involved. We know that that's all that is needed. You'll take care of them for their best. And Father, we ask that you be with us now as we continue. We'll sing. 
We'll offer praise and we'll listen to more of your word. Help us all to participate, to pay attention, and to use what's going on. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 71. and gentlemen glad that you could be here this evening and I hope that what I have to say will stick with your minds and your hearts a little I would like for you for a moment to think of five people that you could call upon to help you if you were in need outside of family members if you would for just a moment think of five people that you could call that they would come and help you. 
Now, first of all, if you can think of five outside of family, that is a wonderful thing. You've got friends and you've got neighbors. And I want to apologize to you if I wasn't one of those five. Because if I wasn't one of those five, I have not been the right kind of neighbor. We're told in the Bible a story of the Good Samaritan. A lawyer asked Jesus a question. What should I do to enjoy eternal life? And Jesus told him an interesting thing. What do the scriptures say? The lawyer knew the scriptures. He quoted from Deuteronomy and he quoted from Leviticus. He went to Leviticus five, as chapter 6 and verse 5 and said, love thy neighbor. But he said before that, you find in Deuteronomy, the 19th chapter and the 18th verse where it says you're to love your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your soul. He had read the scriptures. He knew what it was. And Jesus said an interesting thing to him. You have said what? But something is lacking here. And Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And we all know the story about the priest went by, the Levite went by, and then a Samaritan stopped and helped him. And Jesus, after he told that parable, asked the lawyer a question. See, lawyers are like asking questions, but they don't like answering them. And Jesus said, who was the neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one that showed him mercy. In Micah 6, 8, we're told three things that we should do each and every day. If you would, please turn with me over to Micah. It's in the Old Testament. To chapter 6. And I would like for us to look at verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. When we're being a neighbor, Jesus says we're showing mercy. When we are neighborly, we are showing mercy. We want mercy from God. We want grace from God. But we want mercy. And even in the Old Testament, the people were told by the prophets what they should do. I hope you had five people that you could think of outside of family. If you could, you're well blessed. And if those in the auditorium had you on their list, You are a blessing. And you need to realize that. In a community, neighbors are very important. To have a good neighbor is a great thing. To have a bad neighbor, you need a good fence. When I got ready to buy the 70 acres from Thomas, I took my dad out there to the farm. And we walked around a little bit. And then he left. Went and got in my truck and left me out there. In about an hour, hour and a half, he came back. And my dad told me, he said, son, I don't know your finances, but if you can buy this land, buy it. I found out later he had been to see Adrian Williams, Mr. Wallace, and he had come back. And he told me, he said, son, you can find land anywhere, but you can't find good neighbors. My dad had a second grade education, but he was one of the smartest men I ever knew. Are you a neighbor? Are you neighborly? Do you show mercy to people around you? Not just family, but other people. 
the lawyer knew the scriptures. Jesus asked him. I love the book of Ezra. I like historians, and Ezra is one of the greatest historians that we had. In Ezra 7.10, it states that Ezra purposed in his heart to learn God's law, to live God's law, and to teach his statutes to man. Isn't that what a Christian should do? Shouldn't we learn what God's law for us is? Shouldn't we live it? And folks, you teach it to those around you by how you act and how you do. Now I know I'm talking on Wednesday night to basically the choir. But ladies and gentlemen, are you being a good neighbor? Are you showing mercy, especially to those that we don't want to give mercy to? I leave you with this. God loved us while we were yet sinners. And God loves you. And if there's anything in your life this evening that is not right with God, you need to make it right with God, either privately or publicly. And if you've never become a child of God, the opportunity is here for us now as we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? Pray with me. Our God and Father in heaven, we are thankful to you that we're able to be here tonight. Father, you have studied your word, and may we take it into our heart and apply it. Father, we're thankful for your love, and help us to recognize the mercy, and the great mercy that was shown to us through Christ Jesus. And as Dan has told us tonight, and as your word tells us to Treat others as we would have them to treat us, but to remember how you have treated us, that we can treat others as you would have us to. We thank you for your love, your mercy. Forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>